Suzy Larson here. Welcome to this Faith Radio live stream special event. I'm so glad that you joined us. In fact, I want to know where you're watching from. So give me a shout out and tell me where you're watching from. We are so excited to be with you today. All month on Faith Radio, we've been focusing on the theme of forgiveness. We have discovered that forgiveness really is the key to freedom. Forgiveness is the key to powerful prayers. It really is. It's no wonder why the enemy tries to keep us locked in grudges, mm -hmm. in unforgiveness, in bitterness, because he wants to shut us down. He trembles when we determine to walk free. He hates it when we decide to release mercy so that we can be free of his hooks in our stories and we can go on to do and be everything everything God intended us to be. Well, if you listen to Faith Radio, you know I'm on every day on Suzy Larson Live, three o'clock Central Standard Time. And it's an all awesome show where we talk deeper life issues. Today, we're gonna talk about the power of releasing mercy. We're gonna talk about the heavenly courts, about the fact that our Father is a righteous judge and there's a judicial nature to God. I'm joined by a very precious friend of mine, a prayer warrior. And if you've been following my story, you've heard me talk about these key warrior women who decided to walk with me, march with me, pray with me until I'm fully healed. And the level of healing that I've already experienced is just beyond my wildest dreams. And there's a little bit left to go, but we're determined to lay hold of the promise that we really know and believe God has given to us. And one of the keys to soul freedom for me was releasing mercy to some of the people who hurt me worse. I didn't think I was walking in unforgiveness. I'd forgiven the boys who hurt me when I was a little girl. I counseled about it. I did everything I knew, but I didn't know that my body was still holding on to yeah. trauma. And at the very core of that trauma, uh, the enemy had his hooks in it. He was re-traumatizing me by compelling me to live bracing for impact. And I hear from a lot of you. I know a lot of you live bracing for impact. And this is, there's no condemnation in that, but there's an invitation to walk mm -hmm. free. My friend Melissa Coleman joins me today. She's a lawyer, she's an advocate, she's a teacher, she's one of the most fiery prayer women I have ever met. And God downloaded during a time of ministry uh, just a revelation about the judicial nature of God, the heavenly courts. And when we pray for people and in a certain way, when we walk through an offense and release mercy to them, it takes the enemy's hooks out of the story. We walk free and suddenly we have power in our prayers. So Melissa, welcome. Thank you, Susie. It's I'm really so nice to be here today. So grateful for you in my life. And I just feel like the power of praying together, we'll talk about that in a little bit, because this first is the key, is, is forgiveness and it's mercy. Yeah. And as a lawyer, talk about a time when you were in a, in a ministry moment where you realized this is above my pray, pray grade. I, this is more than I can do. And then God downloaded some wisdom that has turned out to be life-changing for many, many people. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, so there was a lady at my church actually who was dealing with um, torment from a lot of evil spirits. She came from a country where uh, witchcraft and witch doctors were very prevalent in her culture. And um, she was literally being tormented day and night from these witch doctors. And she came to me seeking help. And, um, you know, I just really did feel it was above my pay grade. So I I called the elders in our church, one of whom is my husband. We, we gathered together after church and I watched how they led her um, to pray for mercy, to apply mercy, um, extend mercy to each one of those witch doctors who still had a, a grip on her. And that was the way that she was able to break free from, um, from them and from their access to her. From that, um, she became completely free. And this was, a, this was a new experience for me. I'd never seen anything like it. And so I started to ask the Lord to show me more about this powerful tool of mercy that, um, that he had shown me that day. And in his um, grace towards me, he did that. And you, you it's so fun because you know, you'll text and say, I'm off to speak to college students or I'm off to speak to an organization. And you're leading these organizations and these groups of people through mercy trials and, and they're seeing freedom. And this woman, it was like a light switch. You Absolutely. Know? And I will tell you again, I'm someone who fears God. I really did sort through so much of what happened to me when I was a little girl at the hands of those teenage boys. But what you don't realize is trauma can impact you. It does impact you at a cellular level. And, and when you get to that place, not only were you forgiven, but you're actually releasing mercy. Mm -hmm. It really does. Something happens in the spiritual realm. So yeah. explain the judicial nature of God and why uh, like a mercy trial is so effective in setting so many people free. Well, I think that there's something very, um, it, it, there's a spiritual transaction that takes place when we conduct a trial in the heavenly courts. And when we apply Jesus' mercy, 
Um, when, we, when we choose to forgive somebody, sometimes we just can't quite get there. Um, and and I'm, I've been very honest about that, that there are people that I have really tried to forgive, and I say I forgive them, but I just can't quite get the enemy's hooks fully out of me. And the Lord showed me that's because you're trying to do it on your own. You need the mercy that I purchased for you. You need to um, take the, what is in your bank account and write the check to pay that debt. When I do that, I cut off the enemy's access to me. And um, when the enemy's access is cut off, he's not tormenting me with those painful hurts and memories and feelings anymore. Then my soul can catch up and I can truly forgive. Um, but my willingness to do that is a heart condition, but the transaction is, um, is really applying what Jesus did for all of us to pay for the debt that's created with those sins against us. So often we're afraid to go there because, uh, you know, anger can feel like a fuel. I mean, it is, you know, there's been times when I've been angry and my house is cleaner than it ever is because I'm so efficient, but it's so poisonous and so toxic. And as believers, we don't really have a right to harbor grudges. What did Jesus say about unforgiveness to us as his children? Yeah, this is, um, this is a really big deal in the kingdom because um, Jesus said that if we don't extend mercy to others um, and forgive them of their sins against us, he won't extend mercy to us and forgive us, give us of our sins. And so we often think that the, whatever the offense happened to us is the greater, uh, the bigger sin. But really the Bible teaches us that unforgiveness is the greater sin. That's the plank. Um, what in, in our eye, what somebody did to us is comparatively really the speck. And so we need to get it right because unforgiveness is a very big deal. Jesus paid a very, very high price to forgive us of our sins. And what he asks of us is to do the same um, for others who offend and you, hurt us. We don't really understand it. If you know, I don't know who said it first, but somebody said this 20 years ago. Maybe it was in a song or a poem. But we can't have their list in our hand and our list on the cross, right? And this isn't to make uh, light of the trauma. I mean, we just did a live radio show, and people texted, and I asked them, what do you need to forgive? You could, well, you probably could believe, but the text that came in, like a ticker tape, they came in one after the other of betrayal, of rejection, of sexual abuse. These are massive, massive offenses. These are not small things. But, you know, there's two things that come to my mind. One is we need to understand the judicial nature of God, that he's our father, but he is judge. And the enemy is also a legalist. And if we give him legal access, he will take it. Jesus knew what unforgiveness would do to us. It would poison us, but it's mm -hmm. also a self-righteousness that I'm going to take your forgiveness for me, mm -hmm. but I'm not going to extend it to them. And, and But he also knows what it'll do to our soul, and it gives the enemy legal access to our souls. Mm -hmm. One thing you said before the broadcast was really important for those who've had trauma in their past, you know, maybe you had an unfaithful spouse or maybe you were abused by a parent or something, people that should have protected you, should have been safe, and they're not in your life anymore, but their crime against you is. Mm -hmm. You talk about the importance of naming the crime, and I want to just pause here about this because if, you know, we tend to downplay certain things, and if you blur the lines around what has happened to you, um, you're not going to fully understand the exchange that happens. And, and I, I tend to think if you kind of dumb down, so to speak, the stuff because it's not as bad as them you'll never fully heal from mm -hmm. a crime that you aren't willing to admit or acknowledge and you talk about the importance in fact I'll just let you in on my story I talk about it on the air and it's very very personal but when I came together with these women these praying women um, my little superhero women I thought they were gonna lay hands on me and pray for me to be physically healed instead Melissa taught for 20 minutes on mercy trials and I didn't even really know where it was going but when they came around me and she gave me a little tablet with a Susie Larson attorney client privilege it was this document and it was blank pages in the tablet and the back of the tablet were these mercy trial prayers which we are going to share with you in a moment but she said you've got to name the crime and I'm gonna have her explain why in a moment but just for example she said you know talking about the boys who jumped me on the way home when I was 10 years old. I was jumped and beaten, punched me, kicked me, pulled fistfuls of hair out. And so she said, did they punch you? I said, yes, write it down. Did they kick you? Yes, write it down. That's a crime. So I wrote down all of the crimes. Talk about why it is important to name the crime. Well, like in the natural courts, defendants can't be convicted or acquitted of offenses that have not been specifically named in what we call the charging document. 
So I give people a little legal pad and it's attorney-client privilege, it's between them and Jesus, but that's where they get to write down all of the offenses and it's very important that they're accurate, it's very important that they're honest and complete. Um, I always say, you know, if you miss something, you can always haul them back into court um, to, you know, conduct another trial if it's a different offense. You can never ever haul them back into court for an offense that's already, they've already been acquitted from, that's called double jeopardy, it's forbidden. Um, and so we want to get those offenses down, down on paper and um, then we can conduct our trial appropriately with those offenses. And there's a lot of power in actually naming the offense, yes. as you've said, because mm -hmm. in our culture we, um, we kind of celebrate, um, oh, I, it, didn't, it didn't affect me, I, I'm tough. Um, and we tell other people too, you know, don't, don't be a, a wuss you know, buck up. Other people's pain is worse than yours. The reality is that um, anytime somebody treats us different than they themselves would want to be treated, it does diminish us. And if we keep letting that happen and don't deal with it, um, it can breed uh, anger, um, resentment, hurt, insecurity, all sorts of things that people are living with. And, and it changes God doesn't how want we us to live with that. Amen. And it changes how we relate to God and it changes our view. Absolutely. So if you keep enduring these things and you keep lowering your idea of who you are yes. and what you can expect from other people, your own sense of dignity goes right down the drain, doesn't it? Right. But when you come back up, because you said, you know, we are image bearers. And so if someone is jumping you and beating you or someone cheats on you, that is a crime in the heavenly courts mm -hmm. deserving of punishment. So I filled out my, my form, so to speak. I was guttural sobbing and these women were holding me and it wasn't pretty, it was an ugly cry, but it was so amazing. And then you led me through a mercy trial. So give us an example of what that would look like with somebody's list of offenses. Sure, so you know, every time somebody sins, there is a debt created. If somebody hurts us, wounds us, offends us, um, abuses us, a debt is created. That debt has to be paid for. Um, I think in this month of forgiveness, we've talked a lot about the need to forgive um, and so this is just a tool to show you how to practically apply Jesus's mercy to pay for that offense um, and so once we acknowledge the, the sins against us we've written them down accurately um, we've put the charges down there then we haul them into courts um, as I say we sue them but we don't sue them in the natural courts we sue them in the heavenly courts where something real can happen and be done um, with those debts that are outstanding. And when we bring somebody through a trial, we acknowledge those offenses, we acknowledge that they're guilty, and they are deserving of punishment, okay? Um, these are real offenses. I mean, I can't tell you how many things, the traumas that people have been through. I mean, sexual abuse from fathers, uncles, cousins, brothers, um, betrayals in business. There's been so many offenses that people have dealt with, and. The, the enemy's hooks get in them. And, um, and so once, those, once we haul those defendants into the heavenly courts, we name the charges against them, we acknowledge that they are guilty and deserving of punishment, then we need to take stock and then we make a decision. Am I going to agree with the accuser and condemner and demand that they get what the principles of justice say that they have coming to them, which is an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, or am I going to agree with Jesus and extend, extend the same mercy to that person that Jesus extended to me. When we choose the latter, we actually are able to get the enemy's hooks out of that person, break off the power of accusation and condemnation against them. We are also able to extract the enemy's hooks from us and break off that conduit that has given the enemy access to us to continue to torment our hearts and minds with hurts and pain, painful memories. Um, and so we are, both parties get set free. We declare that person acquitted and forgiven. And then um, we don't commit double jeopardy. If the enemy tries to come back and remind us about all the reasons what we had to hate that person or not forgive them, we just say, no, I chose mercy. I, I choose mercy, I'm sticking with mercy. Devil mm -hmm. get behind me. Mm -hmm. And um, my experience has been, he might try for a little while, but if we commit to not, um, not committing double jeopardy, if we commit to not getting lured back into relationship with the enemy, um, to partner with him to be, to accuse and condemn that offender. If we just say, no, we chose mercy. Mercy has done it. Every bit of condemning evidence against them has been canceled. I'm not going back. We can be completely set free mm -hmm. and it changes 
everything. And you have to really believe that there is a judicial nature to God and that the enemy is a legalist. And if you start to, if you start to read scripture through that lens, you'll he see justice written a lot. You'll see how much God talks about the heavenly courts. There's something very powerful about that. When you understand, to me, it changes prayer so much because you see the enemy is a legalist. I'm giving him no more access in my life. It takes a lot of courage and humility to say, Lord, I'm, let's just, just for an example, John, I'm bringing you into the heavenly court. He does, John doesn't need to know. And I'm making up John. I don't, if you're John, I'm not talking about you. John, I bring you into the heavenly court. You are guilty of these crimes deserving of punishment and you list them. However, because of the mercy that I received from Jesus, I'm extending mercy to you. I release you and I declare you forgiven, acquitted, and free. And now enemy, I serve you notice. You are no longer part of this equation. You cannot triangulate anymore. You are out of this because John is forgiven, acquitted, and free, and I choose mercy. And you plead the blood of Jesus over this situation. Now, some are afraid to do this because they think that, that God just, well, if you're gonna shrug your shoulders, I'm gonna shrug my shoulders, but that's not what you're doing. You are humbly and boldly coming into the heavenly court saying, God, I'm trusting you to do for me what I can't do for myself. Mm -hmm. God is able to carry out justice, discipline, however he needs to do that. But he wants your soul free. He mm -hmm. wants your heart free. And I don't know if you've ever been in a triangulating relationship before where that third party is constantly putting barbs and saying he said, she said, and, and creating so much dysfunction and disorder. You realize this person is not a good part of the equation. They're triangulating and they're putting themselves in the middle and putting us between each other. When you take the enemy out of that triangulation, you get a free and and clear uh, just communication with the Lord because you fear him enough to honor him and do what he says. Mm -hmm. And God will deal with the situation. And one thing you said before the broadcast too is, especially with past traumas, this really is a process by which we give, uh, you know, uh, we take the enemies, um, how do I want to say this? People that maybe still have a presence in our life, but don't, where they, that they, they don't deserve presence anymore. Mm -hmm. They did something horrible mm -hmm. th that was just, you know, devastating to us. We don't even see them anymore. Maybe they've even passed on, but there's the presence to their choices, and this removes that um, the enemy's capacity to keep them involved in mm -hmm. our story. Absolutely, because their sin had created that debt, and that debt is still out there, um, and it needs to be paid for. And so you're right. There's uh, there are people who don't deserve any more of our heart and mind space, who don't deserve to be in our life, and um, this is really the only way to get them completely out of our lives is to apply mercy to that sin and break off that relationship with the accuser against them. Because as long as we're in relationship with the accuser against them, we still have a relationship with that person. Some people do not deserve to be in our lives, um, but they're continually in our heart and mind because uh, the enemy is reminding us of all of those hurts and pains. Because he has a right to be there because we've yes. given him right there. We've given him yeah. that right. Mm -hmm. And so this is a way to um, cut off the enemy's access to us and um, so that we can be completely free. I once was um, conducted a trial over somebody who had um, hurt a family member and um, I didn't realize until months later when I saw that person in public and I went up to them, I walked by them and I just greeted that person and that person was shocked and I was shocked and I'm like, oh, I was, I'm supposed to hate this person. I realized I hadn't thought about that person since the day I conducted that trial. Mm. And I realized the Lord was saying, this is the only way to get out of relationship because he doesn't deserve to be in my life or have any more of my heart and mind space. Um, but then there are people who do and that we have to continue to be in relationship with. So how do we relate to them? And I think that's a, another important question is, um, you know, if it's somebody that's in our circle, first of all, I have seen so many times where somebody's conducted a trial and it changes the other person so dramatically because we are no longer fighting against them. In fact, when we conduct a trial, not only do we have the opportunity to be free from all of the accusation and condemnation against that person, we also have the opportunity to fight for them. It, well, instead of against them, we can fight for them by praying for them. And um, when, we're not, um, when we're not partnering with the accuser and condemner against them anymore, it changes the atmosphere and it changes them. We can become safe to them and we can pray for them with clean hearts and then our prayers are really powerful for them. Mm.
And you know, I would always say this, but everything we walk through has eternal implications. And everything we walk through, our blessings, our battles, uh, our opportunities uh, to steward the kingdom. And uh, when you think about in the heavenly court, the enemy accuses us day and night. So the enemy is constantly picking us apart and he's looking for people to agree with him. Jesus intercedes for us day and night. And you know, you, you can think about that as far as how you think about yourself and how you think about others. Which line are you getting into? Who, whose voice are you agreeing with when it comes to yourself, when it comes to the people in your life? Because if, if you have an opportunity to cast a, an offense, to cast a, a slur, to, to hold a grudge, but you have an invitation to get in line with Jesus as an intercessor. I mean, think of Moses and all the stuff he put up with grumbling Israelites, but he continually put himself between the people and God and interceded and said, we have mercy on us. That that is a kingdom mindset. I don't know if you heard of Catherine Marshall, but she's one of the late greats. She was married to Peter Marshall. Every single night, one of their, their practices they did every night was the anything against any anything against anyone prayer. Mm -hmm. And they would search their hearts. They would say, even if it's a speck of a dot, if they had anything against anyone, if it was that little girl who pushed their daughter at the bus stop, they would release blessing, they would forgive because they just realized the power of a pure heart. It's the pure in heart that see God. And they realized, I'm gonna take so seriously the call of God on my heart that we're gonna keep our hearts clean. Mm -hmm. and, and this is one of the things that is, you guys, you know, I mean, I've been very committed to too, too, but seeing it in a whole new level in our prayer meetings is when we come together to pray for our husbands, our kids, for the rest of my healing, mm -hmm. whatever, you know, even when we walk through battles, there's this high level of fear of the Lord and we've learned to release mercy quickly. Mm -hmm. One of the things you'd said in your teaching was that in the constitution, the, the accused has a right to a speedy trial. Right. And you said, how much more for believers? Absolutely. Can you imagine keeping a defendant in jail until the victim of their crime was ready to give them a trial? Hmm. I mean, honestly, we would all be in jail all the time. None of us would get out of jail. Um, yes, the Constitution guarantees every defendant the right to a speedy trial. We don't have the right to retain um, our claim on those offenses and not give that person a speedy trial where their offenses can be dealt with quickly. Um, it's, it's not just a constitutional principle on earth, but I really believe it's a heavenly principle too. In a, in a culture where we celebrate sometimes victimhood, and we celebrate the right to accuse other people, the Lord is saying, don't fall into that trap. I've talked to people who have um, experienced tremendous trauma and, and there's no diminishing it. I mean, it is really some of the hardest things that human beings can go through. And they have, um, but they've, they have uh, allowed that trauma to continue to torment them for decades. And I've had conversations where I've said, you know, what are you doing about that? Well, I've been through counseling. Um, I've, I've, I'm working on it. And I'm like, well, how is that going for you? And the truth is that it's not going very well for them. Um, the reality is that um, we need to deal with this quickly. And um, that prevents the festering that the enemy loves to exploit to keep us separated from each other, where the Lord wants to restore and redeem, and some relationships redeem as well. Um, I've just seen, you know, I've heard it said that time heals all wounds. I think that that is um, not true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I, I just don't think that there's truth in that. I think that mercy heals. Um, time doesn't. Mercy heals, and it can happen in, in, in an in instant. instant. I've seen people get delivered of things that they have been traumatized for decades in an instant, in a 10-minute um, prayer, and um, all that pain is lifted off. And the Lord, I, I prayed with one lady and I led her through a trial against a husband who had beat her so badly. He had broken bones. Mm -hmm. He had um, given her concussions. He beat her unconscious. And when she, um, when she released mercy over him and um, got out of partnership with the enemy against him, afterwards, everybody in the room clapped. And then she said, I feel so different. I said, really, can you describe it? She said, I feel light. I feel the burden has been lifted off of me. And that weight, the Lord, did, it doesn't matter how broad your shoulders are, you were not designed to carry that weight. Amen. 
the Lord wants to take it off of you and mm. set you free. Oh. You know, Jesus came to destroy the works of the, of the enemy. He came to destroy the works of the enemy. One way he did that was mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And so now our sins as believers, as Christ followers, never again have the power to condemn us. In a judicial system, we are heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. The judge is our father, is our Abba. And our sins no longer have the power to condemn us to hell. Is that not amazing? And when we start to think about the power of, if we don't forgive, there's an accountability before heaven because yeah. of the mercy we receive, but we're also bringing untold misery on our lives. And I will tell you, for me, in the January, February time before we prayed, I was exhausted, I was battered from this wretched illness, but I was emotionally just worn out and discouraged and getting kind of depressed. I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. I had a book to write and I, I wanted to give the contract back and I hope my publisher's not watching because that would be a terrible decision, <laughs> but I'm like, I can't do this. And thankfully my husband's like a big oak tree because he's like, you are not giving the contract back. But it was right at Lenten time when yeah. these dear friends approached me and said, we're going to march with you and pray with you. And that mercy trial that Melissa and the girls conducted with me, I literally in my spirit saw black soot leave my body. And my, I used to be in fight flight. My body was stuck in fight flight. I have low blood pressure and I have a high pulse. So there was always this massive discrepancy because my, my cells and my system was stuck in bracing for impact. Mm -hmm. I was constantly waiting for the next shoe to drop because so many hard things had happened. When this happened, my pulse dropped 20 points within a day or two. Mm. I was out of fight flight. And it wasn't that I needed a 10 day vacation to get ready to write this book. I needed inner healing and it was yeah. like that. And I'm almost done with that book. And I would, I just shudder to think of, I would have made a decision in that hard season that would have been so altering. And I, we're just, we're here today because we want you free because your call matters so much. It, Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. And one of the ways you can destroy the works of the devil is to take the mercy that you've received and release it yes. to the people who've hurt you, knowing full well that you serve a just God. He is not gonna look the other way. He is going to deal with those who've opposed you. And uh, he is a just God. And as, as John Eldridge says, one day your story will be told correctly. You can count on it. You can trust him to work all this out. What if though the person watching today is um, they violated their own conscience? Yeah. What if they've walked in prolonged unforgiveness? You yeah. have a mercy trial where we bring ourselves before the yeah. court deserving of punishment. So talk Absolutely. about that. So yeah, the, the mercy is for us too. And so we can um, conduct a trial and haul ourselves into the uh, heavenly courts and put ourselves in the defendant's seat and charge ourselves with those offenses. Um, and those offenses that the enemy has been accusing you of and condemning you for, and you can name those charges and you can say, I'm guilty, I am deserving of punishment. But Jesus, you paid for mercy for me. And so I am taking that mercy, I'm applying it to each and every one of those sins, and I am declaring myself forgiven, acquitted and free. And I am breaking off the power of the enemy Amen. to accuse and condemn me. I love that verse in Romans that says there's no condemnation for those who of us of for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. The mirror translation of that says um, that every bit of condemning evidence against us is canceled. Hmm. That is good news. Um, I often talk about the third plea option. In the earthly courts, we get two plea options. A defendant can either plead guilty or not guilty. But in the heavenly courts, we actually get a third plea option. We can plead the blood of Jesus, which is what purchased mercy for us. And when we plead the blood of Jesus, our guilt or innocence is irrelevant because the blood of Jesus Hallelujah. covers it all and shuts the mouth of the accuser against mm. us. And it is final. And then he does not get to remind us. Mm. And so I tell people, if the enemy tries to remind you of your past, you remind him of his future. Come on. <laughs> Come on, I'm sorry, just a little bit. Wow, that's so, yeah, so that's amazing. Good. And if you've had trauma in your past, you may be someone more prone to self-contempt, self-condemnation, where you're maybe, you even give others a pass, but you really hold yourself in contempt. Mm -hmm. And that's why that, that mercy trial, so to speak, where you say, if you've known you violated your conscience, if you've maybe held on to a, a prolonged unforgiveness, or you've done something you know you shouldn't have, Conduct a speedy trial with yourself as yes. well. Get before the Lord to say, I'm Susie. Um, I've committed these offenses and these are wrong. And I am guilty and deserving of punishment. However, because of the blood Jesus spilt for me, the mercy that he extends mm -hmm. to me, 
I declare myself full of mercy, forgiven, acquitted, and free by plead the blood of Jesus. I am telling you there's something so powerful about speaking that stuff out that is in direct connection with the scriptures, and the enemy hates it because he's a legalist. He's looking for an opportunity. You know, there's a passage in James uh, 4, 7. It says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. I so often hear it quoted out of context where just resist the devil if he's messing with you. But submit to God is a very important part of that verse, and it's a military term, and it means get back in rank. So when you're out of rank, the enemy has a right mm -hmm. and access to you. So often when that enemy is coming against me, I first ask God, search my heart. Have I given him any access? Because even David said, cleanse me from hidden faults. Keep me back from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Mm -hmm. So there's stuff going on at times where we maybe have violated our conscience, but we've already forgotten about it. And if the enemy hasn't, though, he's, he watches us constantly. He searches around looking for someone to devour. Mm -hmm. If he doesn't find an opening in you, he's going to go find an opening in someone else. So if I'm under attack, I'll say, search me, oh God. Is there anything in me that has given the enemy access to me? If not, then I resist the devil because he has to flee. If so, I repent and then I resist the devil and he has to flee. That, that phrase that he has to flee, he must flee when you resist him, it means two things, to run for his life and to look for safe haven. Mm -hmm. And this is the thing is the enemy has found safe haven in hearts. The enemy has found safe haven in communities. How does he do that? Because we as believers give him legal access and even unbelievers mm -hmm. give him massive legal access. But as believers, who else should be walking in such a fear of God to say, I am not giving the enemy free access to my family, to my heart, to my community. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'm gonna to come together with like-minded believers. He will not found, find no safe haven here. And then together, we are gonna to pray for other families. That's when you start to see things happen. Right, and I think a lot of people might feel like, oh, but what I did is so bad. Um, it's just, I'm the exception. I could never be truly forgiven for this. and. There is no sin that the blood of Jesus that purchased the mercy for us cannot cover and completely pay for. And there, when you think about the people that the Lord used in the past, he used murderers, he used rapists, he used people that committed incest, he used thieves, he used all sorts of people um, because he was able to clean their hearts. Mm. And that's what he wants to do for us. He yeah. wants us to be free. He wants us to get on with the business of why he put us on planet Earth. He gave us a mission and he gave us a vapor of time to accomplish it. So we need to stop being in relationship with the enemy and cut that access off and start getting busy doing the things that God put us on planet Earth to do. Hmm. Your agreement means everything. And as we get ready to wrap here, I don't want to just assume that you know Jesus as your Savior. And if you don't, um, I want to introduce him to you. Jesus is God's son. Jesus, God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son to die for you. He came to earth. He walked this earth. He died a criminal's death, though he committed no sin. And then he rose from the grave. And the Bible says he made a public spectacle against the powers that oppose you. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus came that you would have life and life abundantly. But this isn't just an opt out. I've heard some leaders say that everybody's saved unless you opt out. That's not true. Jesus, the father said only, no, Nobody comes to the Father except through Jesus. And there has to be a point where you acknowledge in your heart and you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth, I am a sinner. I need a savior. I believe Jesus that you lived that you died on that cross for my sins and you rose from the grave, taking the enemy's claim off of me. I need a savior. I declare you as the one true Lord. Would you come into my life? Forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Fill me with the power of your spirit so I will know that I'm grafted into the royal family and that I can know not only that my eternity is secure, but that now in these days I walk in your presence as I live here on earth. You know what? We were once orphans. We were once in the kingdom of darkness. But when you come to Christ, there's a massive spiritual transaction that happens. He takes you out of the kingdom of darkness, puts you into the kingdom of his dear son, the kingdom of light. And you know, it's like if you think of the angels who are looking down from heaven. They're not looking down at us trying to decide who's who in the zoo, who's saved and who's not based on our behavior. Because unfortunately, sometimes Christians don't act like Christians. And other times, unbelievers act better than Christians do. That's unfortunate. And that's for another show and another time. But what they look for 
is the light in our hearts because the light in our hearts serves the enemy and the darkness notice the light of Christ is alive in us. How do you get the light of Jesus in your heart? You invite him into your life. You say, I need a Lord. I need a savior. I'm going to commit to you. I'm going to trust you. Forgive me of my sins. And I'm going to follow you all my days. And I, I pray with all my heart that if you don't know, if you were to die tonight, that you'd wake up in eternity with Jesus because of what the son did, don't waste another day. Pray a simple prayer, but you got to mean it from your heart. It's not a formula. It's not a check the box prayer, get out of hell free. It is a full transaction where you say, I am changing from trusting in man, trusting in myself. I can't jump high enough to get myself saved. So love came down to rescue me. I didn't love him first. He loved me first. I need him. I, I, want, I want a savior and I know Jesus is Lord. Lord. Lord, come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me. Fill me up. I will follow you all my days. And then start to read the Bible. Get in a good Bible teaching church and you will grow in your faith. And if you get any kind of pressure from people saying, well, this is how good Christians should act. And they kind of look down their nose at you. You should just run. Run away. You want to find humble, God-fearing people who have winsome joy about them to say, this whole thing is an invitation. Jesus says, come follow me. Follow him. The Holy Spirit in you will start to convict you. You'll wince a little bit if you say something that once was funny and it's just not funny anymore. You'll feel a little conviction about maybe some of the places you're going or the things you're watching. You'll start to go, wow, I've been bought with a price. The Spirit of God is alive in me. And in Romans 8, it says, when the Spirit connects with you and starts to speak to you, you know this affirms that you actually are one of God's children. So listen to that gentle voice in your spirit. Read God's word so you know what God's voice sounds like. Follow him and you will be on the adventure of your life. And as Melissa said, there's so much work to do. The work exceeds the workers. And as you are grafted into the family of God, there's a holy purpose written over your life. All of his promises are yes and amen. And we are better together. We need each other. Yeah. So I pray that you will walk boldly and humbly and confidently with God because he changes your identity completely. In scripture, it says you went from not having any people to being a people. You went from not having an identity to having an identity. It's a supernatural transaction. And I pray that if, if whether you're new to the faith or you've been uh, walking with Jesus a long time, join us on Faith Radio. If you're not in our listening network, we've got a free app. Go to the, your app store and just search Faith Radio Network. We've got amazing, amazing shows. We have top level leaders and guests on every single day. We give resources away every day. And in honor of this month of forgiveness, we have all kinds of resources right now up on our website, myfaithradio.com. We love you. We want you to last long and finish strong. We want you to have let God's opinion carry far more weight than man's opinion. And as Ann Graham Lotz said several times when she's been on my show, even though you look around at the chaos in the culture, things aren't falling apart. They're falling into place. Jesus is coming and he wants us to live ready. So let's live ready. And one of the ways we do that is to keep our hearts pure before God. We release mercy when we're offended and we trust God to work it out. I pray you found some encouragement here. We'll meet you back here next time.